Hi, I'm Jerry Bingham, the host of Hush Loudly. Welcome back to another exciting episode. Um, I'm going to introduce someone to you that I've been friends with for many years. I'm going to give a shout out to our mothers because they are just grinning from heaven right now. Gracie Brown and R.G. Bingham about their two girls here talking about the stuff we're talking about. But as you know, I talk about introversion, but I also talk about extroversion because we need each other. We balance each other out. And so I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine who is an extrovert and an expert. And we'll, after she tells you who she is, then we'll talk about um, how we need to make different decisions or how I'm suggesting we make different decisions. So welcome, Kimmy Ellen. Tell us about what you do. Okay, thank you. So I'm Kimmy Ellen. I am a certified public accountant, CPA. Shout out to all the CPAs. Shout out. <laughs> there are very few of us. We are actually unicorns. Um, I am the founding partner of Benford Brown & Associates. We are the largest black woman-owned public accounting firm in the country. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. I also sit on a lot of boards. So I sit on the board for NABA, uh, NABA Inc., which is the National Association of Black Accountants. I also sit on the board of uh, the Illinois CPA Society. Um, and then I also am the chairman of the Diverse Organization of Firms. And so the Diverse Organization of Firms is the National Association of Black CPA and Financial Services Firms. And we've been around since 1986. Since that time, I'm the first woman to ever chair the organization. So I am making a history, <laughs> making history. I'm a true champion for um, advancing diversity in the accounting profession because it's just there's a huge pipeline issue. So that's been my my passion um, as of recently. But at Benford Brown & Associates, we are a full service accounting firm. However, we primarily focus on nonprofit audits fiscal agent services. And so that's something that when an, an organization gets a lot of money and they don't really have an, an, an accounting department, we come in and we, we take, we step in and we're their entire accounting department. That's we can also be their outsource. HR department. Um, and we get them ready for their audits and things like that. So that's been the bulk of what we have been doing um, and how we've grown in the last few years. So that is what That's I do professionally. That's and so, lot. yes, it's a lot. Okay. And so I love everything, everything to do with numbers. Yes. Okay. And we are sorority sisters. Yes, Ski we are. Yes, Ski we Line uh, sisters. And line <laughs> sisters. Thank you so much. And grew up together. Yes. Uh, so I want to ask you, like, you talked about sort of what you're working on, where your areas of expertise are. Mm -hmm. What do you think your special power is, your special sauce, your superpower? What do you think it is? So I have um, an uncanny ability to explain financial information in layman's terms. You do. You do. And make you think that, okay, well, what you're saying, yeah, that makes sense to me. I don't, I, I try not to talk above people because in any industry you're in, you're going to have jargon. You're going to have things that everybody in your industry knows about, but not necessarily everyone else. And so I have the ability to explain things in a way that makes it very easy to understand and easy to implement them into your life. You absolutely do. <laughs> and as someone that I reach out to for advice, uh, financially and uh, in terms of even my taxes and reporting and all of that, uh, you do simplify everything for idiots like me and the rest of the world who need it to be simplified. Right. Um, and so why I have Kimmy here today is it's because um, a lot of the research says that introverts um, are less apt to take risks. Mm -hmm. Extroverts take risks. They jump and they do. Um, there's a saying that goes, um, introverts think then do. Mm -hmm. Extroverts think while doing. And I see this on the fly, even just in social situations. Yes. I think um, a lot of times, depending on what kind of career you have, you may be asked to get up and speak. And I was just recently asked to get up and speak last week. I wasn't prepared. And I freaked out a minute because I'm like, I'm not prepared. I am prepared, but I was a little nervous about it and I did what I needed to do. But I feel like extroverts are like, yeah, I'm in. Tell, Yeah, I'm, I'm there. You know, so I just feel like it's a little different. Not one way is better than the other. I think it's just different. And I know that uh, over the years, you've said to me, 
you need to be doing this. You need to invest in this. You make too much money. You need to be giving more money away. You, you, you tell me all of these things. And so I have you here because I wanted to ask you about how you make decisions as an extrovert and also as a professional with your background. So how do you make, let's say, overall decisions, whether it's your trips or to be on this board, to be on whatever. And then I want us to talk about financial decisions, investment decisions, and all of that. So I am one of those people, you're absolutely right. I'll just jump in and start doing it and think while I'm doing it. And I envy that. I love that. (laughs) But I prepare myself for it in that I am constantly reading. So whereas some people are reading romance novels or magazines, I'm reading books about finances. I am listening to podcasts talking about finances. I'm learning about how to build generational wealth. Like that's what I actually enjoy reading about. So I can jump right in and start doing it, but that's because I've already read about it probably in 10 or 12 different books. So it's like you're prepared or you're preparing along the way. Along the way, yes. And then one of the things about, you know, for years and years and years, I prepared tax, uh, individual tax returns. And so someone can walk into my office with their tax documents and I can know a lot about them just by looking at the documents that they have. Like what? Um, I know whether or not they spend or save. I know if they have a heart to give. Um, and then I know if they are um, if they are respecting their ability to earn money. Hmm. Um, I have a lot of small businesses over the years that will come in, and this was, you know, maybe 30 years ago, with a shoebox of receipts. You walking in with that tells me you don't really respect your accounting Hmm. because you just kind of threw it into a box and you thought someone was going to organize it. And so that tells me a lot about how you feel about your business because if this is your business, you're going to take some time and get to know what it means. And if you don't have those financial um, statements, you really can't make good financial decisions. Hmm. And a lot of people don't even know whether or not their business made money until the end of the year because they're not looking at the finances. And so, yes, I can look at some documents. I I can look at your documents and and see, hmm, okay. Um, You know, people that make what's considered to be, you know, middle class, upper middle class, who walk in without any business uh, documents or any um, um, interest and dividend statements. Well, what are you investing in? You know, I also, I walk a lot with my girlfriends and I have one girlfriend and she and I were walking once. And so she mentioned life insurance and I was like, oh, well, tell me about your life insurance. Because even though, you know, we're walking, we can, we can talk about money. And she's like, well, it's at my job. I said, oh, then you don't have a policy your job has a life insurance policy on you. And so she didn't understand that until um, I said something to her and she was like, I need a, I need my own policy. Yeah. Because if you leave that job, yes, then you can, you know, you won't have any life insurance if you leave that job. So if you, if you have your own, then you can have that as well. Now, some policies at at, um, employers will let you uh, port it and take it with you. Oh, really? But the majority of them, it's, it's there at the company. So um, just being prepared, though, reading, reading, reading. I I read a statistic once that um, the average person doesn't read. uh, Once they graduate from high school, they stop reading. I literally am probably reading right now about 10 simultaneous books. Wow. (laughs) And so that helps you make decisions. Yes. And and so and that's even personal decisions. Yes. Like if you want to take a trip or Mm -hmm. whatever like that. Yes. Okay. so let's talk about risk. Um, how do you decide, you know, so you'll say to me, oh, I'm going to buy a house on Martha's Vineyard. I'm going to do something like that. Maybe that's different because I know you go there all the time. But what about um, deciding to invest in something? You know, and right. I remember we talked one point and one and I was like, what? And you said, well, what do you like? Yes. You know, do you like Starbucks? Do you like so tell yes. us about that and how to make a because for an introvert like me, mm-hmm who am am more sort of slow and steady. Um, But I do like to save money. I do want to invest, but I may be more cautious Mm -hmm. with dipping my toe. So talk to us in that way for our introverted audience and for our extroverted audience. So you should really invest, and this has been my rule, based on where you are in life. So in your 20s, 
you should be vet investing in aggressive, in, aggressively in the stock market, in aggressive stocks, whether you're an introvert or extrovert. Why? Because you have 40 years before you need the money. In your 30s, now we're going to pull back. So we're not going to be as aggressive, but now we can be moderately aggressive. And every 10 years, you should then slow your aggression so that by the time you hit 60, now you're investing in conservative investments. And so, you know, I, but when I told you to invest in what you like, uh, a friend of mine who's a, a certified financial planner, he always says that he um, applies the Warren Buffett rule. So invest in your backyard. Ooh. And so I asked him, 12 years ago. What does that mean? He's like, well, I grew up with um, in a state that has oil wells. So I invested in Exxon Mobil and, you know, Amoco and BP and all of that because it was in my backyard and that's what that's I knew. That's what you know. And, you know, that's how he started investing. So what did I start investing in? I started investing in mutual funds that were kid friendly because I had children. So that w that started me with the, at the time, I think it was Strong Funds Young Investors Fund um, because I wanted to invest in things that my kids would want. And so just over the years, I've developed relationships with financial planners. And so a lot of times I'll talk to them as well and get their idea, okay, how much insurance should I have? Because you don't want to be heavy on insurance and have no stocks, but you also don't want to be heavy on stocks and have no insurance. And so it's about just learning what it is that you want to have in your portfolio. Because by 50, we should have a portfolio. You should not have just one. I have people who come in who make $150,000, $200,000, and all they have is a W-2 and a 1098 mortgage interest statement. And that's it. And so I no IRA, no money going Well, the IRA anywhere. doesn't, you don't have anything for the IRA other than what you put in it for the year because it's mm -hmm. not a tax, the only thing, it's not a taxable event. Now, if you pull money out of an IRA, which you should never do, mm -hmm. never pull money out to mm -hmm. pay a bill because you will always have bills. But what you won't have is the amount of time that it takes to replenish that. So, you know, for IRA, yes, you can put the money in every year and you should, and you should start that for your children when they're young, get a custodial IRA. And you have the time, you have the appreciation of time that allows you to really grow. Um, we'll talk about kids too at some point, but I want to stay on this with okay. the investing. Um, so in my own backyard, so that does give me some comfort if mm -hmm. it's something that I like or something that I know. But then how do you know what to start with? How much do you, you know, and, and then how do you decide and who helps you and how do you tell someone who has no idea where to start? So the first thing you want to do is you want to write down all of your income, all of your monthly bills, and then all of your debt. So, you know, it's because you may have a mortgage payment, but you also need to know what your overall debt is on that mortgage because you need to be able to determine how much disposable income you have every month before the Starbucks, before, before the dinners, dinners, before you even take the vacation, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. know what you have and then take it out before you get a chance to spend it. That yeah. was what worked for me. Yeah. I took it out before I had an opportunity mm -hmm. to buy something else with it. Mm -hmm. And once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and then, you know, you just look at it periodically and maybe talk to your investment, at, at, um, your investment advisor, always find a certified financial planner to help you with it. But you can really get, I got started with $50 in an aerial fund because they were in Chicago and their motto was slow and steady wins the yeah. race. Mm -hmm. And so I started with them in probably the, the mid nineties just because I was like, well, I'm going to do this slow and steady and mm -hmm. I'm going to win this race mm -hmm. of investing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I started. So number one, find out what you have every month. And then I always tell people when you get a raise at work, put more money in your IRA or 403B um, or 401k, whatever it is you have as a retirement, because you're already living off what you were living off last month. And right. just because you got a 12% raise this month, put more money into your 401k because you know you can already live off this. Right. And so as you start to as you start to see that balance get higher and higher, you actually want to invest more. And so it's really a good thing to invest monthly. And and it just if you do that 
then you you get the the benefit of of time for it to grow. The, the, and you have to be okay with the stock market going down sometimes because it's going to come back up. And think of it like this. When it goes down, it's on sale. Okay. Buy more. Oh. When Tesla drops, I buy more Tesla. Okay. I know it's coming back up. Yeah. And so, you know, be okay when it goes down. And I remember having to talk to my dad, talk him off the ledge. You can't take everything out, Daddy. We we're we're gonna be fine. Just yeah. let's ride this wave. But as you get closer to retirement, that's why you don't want to have as much of your money in risky stocks because you want the, you know, you want the market to be stable um, as you start to get to the point where you actually need the money. And that has happened to me where I have my money with the guy at Edward Jones and. I get these statements and I saw it going down. Was it during the pandemic? I can't remember. It was recently. And I was like, Joe, and he's like, no, it's fine. You're good. You know, you're fine. And he's right. And it came right back up. But what if you had bought more I it didn't was even down? Think, yes. That would have been brilliant, wouldn't yes. it? It's on sale. Um, and so um, do you consider it like a risk? Like if you absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Everything is a risk that's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you do have some types of instruments that are guaranteed like annuities. And there are some annuities that are guaranteed for a certain amount. Your savings account is guaranteed because it's, it's FDIC insured. But you aren't making any money on the You're making account. pennies. Now, right. they're using your money to lend it out. So you might make 1% a year, but they're taking your same money and lending it to someone with a mortgage and charging them 6% a year. So they're making that 5% cushion. You always want to have something in savings, though. You want to have three to six months of your living expenses in savings. Um, but you want to actively invest. Okay. Um, and so what happens if you make a bad decision and has that happened with you? Oh, have absolutely. you, so do you, can you recall, you don't have to get, tell us all your business, but how, what happens when you think this is the right thing, mm -hmm. you do your research and then it doesn't pan out? Yeah, I'll tell you a, a real life example. So I invested in an annuity because someone told me, oh, this is a great annuity. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And three, four, five years in, I'm like, it's not really moving. It's not moving with the market. You know, you can see what the market is making. Yes. And so then I'm reading it and reading it and reading. It and I was like, this is going to give me $500 a month at retirement. What am I going to do with $500 a month? But I had to stay in that investment for seven years or I would have been penalized for pulling it out oh, early. Wow. So I waited mm -hmm. and waited and waited. And finally, when that seventh year hit... I then rolled it in from the annuity into uh, my regular IRA and then had my financial planner start to invest it. And it already went up like 30% in, in, you know, in the time that I've done that since, but wow. I had to wait it out. That was really painful. <laughs> because you know, in that seven year period, you could have had it somewhere else making more money making for more you. Making more money. But I was, and I didn't want to pull it out and pay the penalty. Um, the early, no. the early penalty. So I just left it. And, and, and here's the thing. I tell every, everybody this, I either win or I learn. So I love that. Yes. Not win or lose, win or, or learn. learn. I love so that. So I learned then that the type of annuity that I was investing in was not the type of annuity that I want to not, there are other types that are, that are okay, but this one wasn't a good investment for me. And so I had to regroup move that money, and and now it's working. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could talk about, uh, I want to talk about kids. Uh, I want to talk about, so I think most people we know, our kids are a little older, um, but what if you have a newborn or a three-year-old? Mm -hmm. What should you be thinking about? I know people talk about college, but, you know, what should you really be thinking about for that kid? And how about as a teenager as well? Mm -hmm. So... First of all, so I, I love talking to teens about financial literacy. So that's right. And that's, you're going to be writing a book about that, right? Definitely. Okay. So I'm writing a book about teens and financial literacy. And then I'm going to be writing a book about, well, I'm, I've already written the book um, for young college graduates. When you're making your first important financial decisions. Like when I first went away to college and in the bookstore, you had all these applications for, for credit these cards. credit cards. We all got And it. I filled out every single American one. American Express, three, four visas. Ridiculous. I even, I went to the mall and got a, a Carson's card. And a, and a Marshall Fields card. Like, and no job. And no job whatsoever. <laughs> and I had an allowance. That's what I <laughs> had. Me too. Me too. Okay, I'm Thank sorry. You. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but 
um, helping, helping those kids make decisions. Make decisions college. Mm-hmm. now. And I tell this, I wish I knew then what I know now. Yes. So I'm better now. So I have a stepson who actually has a two and a half year old. So I put a hundred dollars a month in an investment, a TD Ameritrade account for her. It's a custodial account which means it's in her name, but I have custody of it. And so every month I have an automatic $100 withdrawal. If I just invest in just regular index funds, by the time she turns, I think 21, it'll be, it should be worth about $77,000. Wow. And so that will be her gift as she graduates college. Now, I was not one of those parents who saved for college. I just did not listen to myself. And I was like, I'm just going to have to figure this out. I was lucky that I had kids who picked schools that I could afford to send them to. And I had a very generous dad. So, (laughs) (laughs) but, you know, a lot of people will put all their money into a 529 plan. Yeah. What happens if your child goes to trade school? What if, what if he wants to be an electrician or a plumber? Plumber. And be a plumber. A ton of, right. Be don't, a plumber. don't sleep on those <laughs> plumbers, plumbers make so much money. electricians, yes. all of those. But if you if you go to those schools, those, those are trade schools that don't cost anything. So now what are you going to do with the money that's sitting in this 529? If you have a different, if you have another well, child, you can transfer it to that child. Okay. If not, and you need to take it off, you get, you take it out, you get penalized. Shut up. Because you're not using it for educational purposes. And so while a 529 plan is good, um, it's also about diversifying. So maybe not have all of your money in the 529 plan. Some state school, state plans, um, Illinois is not one of them, but some state plans, if you put your money in a 529 state plan, your child has to go to school in that state. What? Okay. I well, bet people don't know that. I hope that no. they ask questions. And I get hope that they do too. So, but if you have just an investment account, they can go wherever. Right. Or if they decide I'm going to be a programmer, I'm going to be a code or something else that doesn't require right. the, the education right. for all of these other things. Or if they get a full scholarship and don't have to pay for school. Right. Now, they, you can use it for graduate school. You know, mm-hmm. you can use it for a doctorate or medical school or law school or whatever. But if they are in school and they don't need it, then what do you do? Do. You have to transfer it to someone else in the family. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't work if you have an only child. That doesn't work if, right. you know, both kids go to trade schools. And so that's why it's important when the children are young to start investing for them early and to start to talk to a financial planner early so that you know what's available and what's the best decision for you and your family. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, you had me just thinking about people our age now are, some are getting divorced Mm -hmm. and they are, um, or getting married again. Mm -hmm. And so they're sort of starting over. Um, and so I'm sure it's difficult when you were in a marriage and you were sharing the costs of things Mm -hmm. and then now you're on your own. How would you advise women like us, our age, who uh, may be starting over? What are some things that they should be doing or thinking about? So what I always tell young women, so before they get to our age, young women, is always live below your means so that when you, when and if you need to leave, you can leave without there having to be, well, I have to stay because I can't afford the mortgage on my own. So start early. Now, if you haven't, but now you're leaving and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't, maybe, maybe I can't afford this mortgage. Oh, well, I need to buy a car too. You know, it's, it's a lot to think about at one time. And so you don't want to take a lot of money down if you have to, if you don't have to, because those of course trigger, trigger tax events. And so we're trying to make, to make sure that we are monitoring our tax situation every year. But um, honestly, you have to really plan for it. Um, you know, there, there are certain things that are going to happen to all of us. There are certain things we're all going to die. Yes. And we're all going to have to pay taxes. Yes. So (laughs) (laughs) we have to plan for things, but you should always plan, um, for almost for a worst case scenario and hope for the best and work towards the best and wish for the best. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yes, I have a lot of friends like myself starting over and it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? The first thing I'm not going to do is we're not going to fight over this money because we cannot give all the money to our attorneys. We need to make sure that we are investing in our children. And so maybe mm-hmm. you do things like put your properties in trust and make the, the, the children, the beneficiary of the trust. Now we're not arguing over the house. The kids actually own the house, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's different things that you can do. You can also prepare your children. You know, whenever my children buy property or they have investments, we put it in a trust. 
because then it's premarital. So now, oh, so yeah. when they get married, it, oh, it's all premarital. Okay. So learned that from a CPA who's also an attorney. Okay. Um, and so I, I didn't even know that, um, but learned that about 15 years ago. And so you, you start to talk to people. And like you said, oh, I'm, you don't want to say this because, you know, you don't tell me everything. No, tell me everything. Yes. Let's share as much information as possible because honestly, it makes us both better decision makers. And I, you, I saw you recently on another television program and you talked about you're seeing something with tax refunds that they're less or something this year. Tell us a little bit more about, about oh, that. Now you're going to get people mad. Okay. So well, you're, you're telling you, us the truth here. <laughs> so if you're filing your 2022 tax return, which is what people are doing now, you will likely see that your refund will go down substantially from previous years or you may owe. And the reason is, number one, a lot of people are actually getting 1099 dividends or 1099 um, B statements from their investment accounts because their mutual fund, their mutual fund managers sold investments to kind of uh, counteract some of the losses. And so they actually had gains when they didn't even know they were having gains because they're not actively managing it. So that's the first thing. You have untaxed capital gains. You're looking because you're thinking, oh, mm -hmm, I'm probably going to have mm -hmm. that. You're going to have untaxed capital gains that you have to pay tax on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this is now the first year in a number of years where there's no stimulus anywhere. There's no stimulus for your children. There's no stimulus for you. And so for people who maybe didn't get the stimulus at the time, but then once they filed their taxes, they were able to capture that stimulus. Yes. That's gone. The other thing is there was an additional child tax credit under the Biden administration that gave, um, if your children were under 18, you got an additional tax credit, but if they were under six, you got even more. And so if you have two children under the age of six, you're actually going to get, I think, thirty-two two or $3,600 less of Ooh. a tax credit. That's substantial. <laughs> if you were is. only getting $5,000 before and now you're going to take 3600 that's a huge difference. Yeah. And so... Do not get mad at your tax preparer when they tell you <laughs> that you're getting less. It's just everything is happening at the same time. In addition to, if you remember years ago when um, the, the, the previous uh, president was in, there was a, a tax law that was passed where it doubled your standard deduction. Um, but what it meant was that a lot of people didn't itemize anymore. They took the standard deduction. I remember that. I remember. Mm -hmm. And so the... And so once they saw that they were not able to itemize, people stopped giving because they weren't getting a tax deduction for it. And so, you know, you saw that. It was too bad. But you kind of saw that fall out. Or people gave all in one year, mm -hmm. and then they wouldn't give for two more years. And then they give all in one year again because then it would be enough at one time. So wow. just planning it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And uh, we have to wrap up. I've enjoyed you so much. And I want you to tell people, because I know you on your platforms, I feel like I learned so much from you. So tell us how people can find you because you're always shouting out tips and giving good information. So how can people find you? So you can find me on LinkedIn at Kimmy Ellen. Um, I'm a CPA. So let's just say Kimmy Ellen CPA. And that's K-I-M-I. -I. Last name Ellen. Yes, I have two first names. <laughs> <laughs> so Kimmy Ellen Kimmy CPA, Ellen CPA on, LinkedIn. on LinkedIn. And so I share a lot of tidbits um, if I do like a story on Bloomberg, I'll share all of those. So that's the best way to find me though. Okay. Well, thank you. We'll be following you. Thank you for being here today. My extroverted investing financially literate person friend. Uh, thank you for joining us on Hush Loudly and we'll see you next time.